and um, calculations and so forth. All right. <clears throat> well, last time um, when I finished, I was talking about gel electrophoresis, and I uh, was talking specifically about agarose gel electrophoresis, which you don't even see up here. So let me just say a brief word about that, and then uh, move on into the other material. So the reason I chose to talk about uh, agarose gel electrophoresis first is because uh, agarose gel electrophoresis is probably the easiest uh, to understand. Um, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is not complicated to understand, but it's usually used to separate proteins. And uh, separating proteins takes some additional considerations, as we shall see. So I want you to understand the simplest situation first, and then we'll talk about the slightly more complex situation uh, with separating proteins. So if you recall, I said last time that we uh, pour a gel by a, a technique very similar to making jello. We take a carbohydrate uh, that has a very complex structure. Uh, we dissolve it in water by boiling it. And then as it cools down, that carbohydrate forms a sort of a matrix that loosely holds water. And by the fact that it loosely holds water, it gives it <clears throat> excuse me, that sort of gelatinous characteristic. Well, the holding of the water um, involves things like um, uh, various holes in which uh, the water itself is sort of encased. And those holes serve as pores for the molecules that we're trying to separate. Okay? So that's an important uh, consideration. So the, the uh, agarose itself can be thought of as what I would call a support. It's just a mesh of fibers that are intermeshed and they can give various pores through which the uh, macromolecules can be separated. The macromolecules that are separated on gel, uh, on the agarose gel electrophoresis are almost always nucleic acid molecules, usually DNA, sometimes RNA. And the reason for this is that these are the biggest biological molecules that exist in cells. They're way bigger than proteins. Proteins don't even come close, okay? So these are very large molecules, and these very large molecules are negatively charged. They're what we describe as polyanionic, meaning that they have many, many, many negative charges. In fact, they have one negative charge for every nucleotide that they contain. Okay? Because it's phosphates that provide the backbone or part of the backbone of a nucleic acid structure. All right? So that's an important <coughs> excuse me, that's an important consideration. That negative charge is used effectively to separate them. Now, though, though this says polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, an agarose gel will look very, very similar. Okay? So here is an agarose or a polyacrylamide gel, and I've got my mixture of a bunch of different nucleic acids that I want to separate. What this technique does is it separates them on the basis of size. And the basis of size, um, the separation occurs as follows. The nucleic acids are loaded in here. They're a mixture, a whole bunch of different sizes. And after they've been loaded into that little well right there, um, a current is applied. And the current that is applied has a negative charge at the top and a positive charge at the bottom. So what happens then is that the polyanionic uh, negatively charged um, nucleic acids race to get away. Well, effectively, they all have the same size to charge ratio. Bigger ones have more charges, so the ratio of size to charge is equal for all of those, meaning that the force that's pulling them through is equal for all of those molecules. Okay? On a, on a per size basis, it is. Now, what that means then is that the basis on which they charge is by which ones can get fastest through that mesh of fibers. Well, the ones that can move the fastest are the smallest. So the smallest guys move first, and the slowest guy, or the biggest guys, move much more slowly. Okay? They have a harder time getting through that mesh. And that's a very basic principle of gel electrophoresis in general. Okay, so that's sort of repeating what I said on Friday. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Uh, the next technique that we use for separating actually relates more specifically to proteins, although this also works for nucleic acids, and that's polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So the first question you may have is, well, what's the difference between the two? The difference between the two is polyacrylamide uh, gel electrophoresis uses, instead of a carbohydrate like agarose, it uses a, uh, a chemical 
a, a fiber network. So it's a chemical fiber network that you actually set up in a reaction. And that network that's present in a polyacrylamide gel is generally has much smaller pores than an agarose gel. So we're separating smaller things. And as I told you, proteins are much smaller than nucleic acids are. Now, if we take a mixture of proteins, like I took a mixture of nucleic acids, and I apply them to the top of a gel such as I have described, okay, I will have some problems. Okay? What are some problems I'm going to have? There's two. The charges can be different, right? So whereas I had nucleic acids, I had negative charge, I knew exactly what I had. I put a negative charge at the top. Some proteins are going to be positively charged. That's not going to be good. Okay? There's another problem. It's more subtle, but it relates to something I've said already. Anybody have any idea what it is? Probably not. Give you a chance. Charge to size ratio, exactly. So even if we have negatively charged proteins, their charge to size ratio is not relatively constant as it is for a nucleic acid. So in order for us to separate proteins, we have to do some tricks to first of all make them negatively charged and second of all make, them, make their approximate size to charge ratio be the same. The technique we do is we take the proteins and we mix them with a detergent known as sodium dodecyl sulfate or as you're much more likely to call it, SDS. Now, what that does is, first of all, it's a detergent. And it's a detergent because it has a sulfate on it that has a negative charge on one end, and it has some very, a very long nonpolar tail. Okay? It turns out that what this detergent does with proteins is it denatures the protein so that instead of being all coiled up like a clump, it actually kind of lays it out like it's a long chain, the way we kind of draw the structures in the book. And moreover, it coats that long chain sort of cylindrically with a, um, a coating of the SDS molecules. But what that means then is that we have many, many negative charges on the outside of that protein. They mask any charges that are underneath them. So for all intents and purposes, that uh, protein looks like a rod, kind of like the DNA looked like. And it's a polyanionic, meaning it has many negative charge rod. And best of all, the longer the rod, the more the negative charges. So now we have, again, approximately the same charge, uh, size to charge ratio like we had for nucleic acids. So we've tricked the system so that we now have our proteins all having many negative charges. After we've done that, we can apply those, that mixture of proteins to our polyacrylamide gel. And when we do that, we run something called SDS PAGE. PAGE stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So SDS PAGE involves just what I said, mixing the proteins with SDS, applying them to a polyacrylamide gel, and then running them through. Well, when we do that, we see something very similar to what we saw with nucleic acids. That is, that these guys separate on the basis of charge. Uh, on the basis of charge. Basis of size. Okay? The smallest guys move the fastest. They move away from the negative end. And again, we put the negative at the top and the positive at the bottom. So the force that is pushing slash pulling these proteins through this gel is uh, the electrical field that's there. The electrical current is actually helping to pull these guys through, and they separate on the basis of size. OK, everybody got that? Why would you need a, a gel with smaller pores? Why would you need a gel with smaller pores? Well, if they're too big, then all of them are going to go through equally well. So you have to have sort of a sieving, a sieving phenomenon, where if some of it's a little bit more difficult, they have a harder time going through, kind of like the reverse of what we saw with the, uh, the beads uh, in doing gel filtration. Okay? In this case, they all make it through, but some have more difficulty making it through than others do. And that's, that's a key feature. And one of the things you have to do in both um, agarose gel electrophoresis and also polyacrylamide is you, you frequently have to adjust the pore sizes based on what you're trying to do. So you may have to run a higher percentage of agarose, for example, if you're separating smaller 
uh, DNA molecules. You may have to run a higher polyacrylamide gel, uh, polyacrylamide percentage if you're running smaller proteins because the higher the percentages, the smaller the pores. So we have to optimize these a little bit to do the separations that we want. Okay, so that's what's up with what's called one-dimensional gel electrophoresis. And one-dimensional gel electrophoresis is a very uh, powerful technique. Okay, there's SDS if you want to see it. That's what it looks like, long chain. There's a sulfate. There's a counter ion out there. We can see it's very, largely very natively charged on the outside. This is what a gel looks like after you run it. And what you see are bands, and each band corresponds to molecules that are identical in size because, of course, they all migrate to the same place. In this particular gel, you see on the left side and on the right side, you see something called a ladder. So a ladder is typically a set of standards that have, in this case, proteins that are all of, of known sizes. So this might be, for example, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, molecular weight, and by looking at a gel like this, I can actually determine approximately the size of my protein by comparing my unknown protein to the size of the known proteins that are in the lab. This also is, is nice because it illustrates what the people were trying to do as they were purifying this protein. So each one of these wells corresponds to an additional step of purification, so they're getting more and more pure protein as uh, they're going along. Okay, um, now, if you understand poly SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, then you're equipped now to understand um, an, an additional technique that I think is one of the coolest techniques that exists in uh, molecular biology, and this is a technique called two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, okay? So we're going to talk about that, and then I hope to communicate to you the power that 2D gel electrophoresis gives us uh, in an analysis. So, to understand that, we have to understand a technique, first of all, called isoelectric focusing. Isoelectric focusing. This takes a little thinking here. So, to do isoelectric focusing, I really need to, first of all, separate proteins on the basis of their PI. The basis of their PI. So, we've been talking about PI. I promised you that PI would become important, and now, I hope you begin to see why the PI of a protein is a useful thing for us to have and to know. Okay? Well, how do we set it up? First of all, we take a tube. So a tube is just like uh, the column that we uh, are doing our other uh, separations in. We take a tube, and into this tube, we pour a um, set of um, beads okay, that have on them various charges. Some of them have maybe, let's say, 100 negative charges. Another one would have 99. Another would have 98, 97, 96, et cetera. So we have a whole spectrum of negative charges from, from one, minus 100 all the way down to zero. Similarly, in that same column, we pour beads that have positive charges of a similar nature. They go from, again, zero up to, say, plus 100. Now, if I take that mixture and I just take it as it is without doing anything else to it and I apply an electrical current to it, what's going to happen? Well, the negatives are going to go as close to the positive electrode as they can. The positives are going to go as close to the negative electrode as they can because of the attractive nature and the repulsive nature of each. And what's going to happen is the most negative will be adjacent to the positive. That is, the ones that have 100 negative charges are going to push everybody else out of the way because they've got a greater force and they can actually get closer to that positive electrode where they want to be. At the other end, the positively charged beads want to get to that negative, and again, the one that has the most positive charges is going to be there. Okay? Now, what I've just described to you is a gradient of charge, and that gradient of charge actually sets up a pH gradient going from 0 at one end to 14 at the other. Okay? So now we have a tube that has a gradient of pH as well as a gradient of charge. Everybody with me? Okay. Now, what does that mean? It means that if instead of putting nothing in that tube, what if I start the tube out with this mixture of these compounds and I also add my proteins? 
what's going to happen? Well, my proteins are going to separate just like those individual beads separated. They're going to separate at the same time, and they're going to go to a certain distance, and they're going to stop. Why will they stop after a certain distance? They have reached their PI. At that charge, they have a net charge of zero, and in electrical field, they're not going to move anymore. So now, this isoelectric focusing technique is allowing me to separate molecules on the basis of their PI. Those that have a low PI will be at one end. Those that have a high PI will be at the other end. And which end is which doesn't really matter for our purposes. We can set it up any way that we want to. But it's important to recognize that we've set up a pH gradient, and we have separated proteins on the basis of their PI. The most positive ones will be at one end. The most negative ones will be at the other end, and sort of a gradient in between. Well, I said two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, but I've only told you one dimension. The dimension I've just told you is separation on the basis of PI. So I've got this tube. Here's this tube that's got my proteins in there, and there's got this whole series of bands of proteins, each of which have different PI values. Okay. Now, if I take that tube and I cut a little slice in it so that I let the material on it sit on top of a polyacrylamide gel, okay, now I'm going to do something cool. I have that slice now sitting on top of that polyacrylamide gel. I'm going to have to add something to it to separate everybody on the basis of size. What am I going to have to add? SDS, right? So now I let SDS sort of perfuse into this thing. So the proteins start absorbing. They start denaturing. So they make these long rods. But they still keep their relative position. They stay where they were. They don't move left or right. They stay right where they were. But in each place, they're now uh, coated with SDS. And they're ready for the next dimension. We're going to now run them through the polyacrylamide gel uh, and separate them. Okay? When we do the second dimension, they're going to separate not on the basis of their charge or their PI, but rather they're going to separate on the basis of their size. Okay? Here's a depiction. So I did the first dimension. I separate everybody on the basis of PI. Then I added SDS. And then I said, OK, now put a negative charge up here and run these guys downwards in the second dimension. If we look at this, what we see is that we have a series of proteins, the biggest ones at the top, the ones that have the most positive charge on the left, the ones that have the most negative charge on the right. Okay? And we've separated every protein in that mixture. And we can look at this band and we can say, oh, well, this had a PI of about 4.3. This must have a PI of 4.3. These guys in this row, in this column here, all must have a charge of about 4, must have a PI of about 4.3. Well, how many proteins do I have in my cell that have a PI of 4.3? I can calculate that reasonably easily. <coughs> and I can say how many of them have a molecular weight of about 22,000, for example. OK, so I have a tool now that is enabling me to look very carefully at my proteins and characterize them. The beauty of this technique is it is so good at separating proteins in these two dimensions. It's so good at this that we can literally separate every protein in a cell. Okay? We might have 6,000 or so proteins in a cell at any given time. We can separate all 6,000 of them on a gel like this. If we do that, we create a gel that looks something like this. That is the profile of proteins that was found for a particular cell. Okay? In this case, we had the most positives on the left, the most positive on the right. That's random as to which, however we do it, so it doesn't really matter. We had the biggest guys at the top. We had the smallest guys at the bottom. Now, each spot on here corresponds to an individual protein that this cell was making. The darker the spot, the more of that particular protein that's being made. The lighter the spot, the less of that particular protein that's being made. Well, why do I care about this? There's two reasons why I care about this. First, I want to describe 
a very simple experiment that we can do using 2D gel electrophoresis. I think it will demonstrate to you the power of this technique. Let's imagine that I'm interested in studying cancer. And I have a patient who has a liver cancer. Okay? And the thing I want to know is, what is it about this cancer that's different from a normal liver? So I take some cancer cells from a tumor I removed from the patient. At the same time, I remove some non-cancerous liver cells from the patient. I grind them up. I pull out the proteins. And then I take the proteins and I perform 2D gel electrophoresis. So in the first case, I run a 2D gel of the proteins that are from the normal cells. In the second case, I run a 2D gel from the, the cells that had the cancer. And I ask a very simple question, and the computer can do this for me nicely. Which spots change between the two? Do I have spots that appear in the cancer cell but not in the regular cell? <laughs> Do I have proteins that appear in the regular cell but not the cancer cell? Do I have more of this particular protein right here in the regular cell compared to the cancer cell and vice versa? All these questions I can answer and I can begin to understand at the perspective of the protein what the difference is between a cancer cell and a regular cell. It's a very, very powerful technique. This technique I just described to you is part of a sort of giant technology called proteomics. You heard genomics. This is proteomics. This allows, proteomics allows a researcher to analyze all the proteins of a cell simultaneously. It's different from the other techniques we've talked about. It's a relatively new technique. Okay? So we have the ability to do that. The, can the cells needn't be cancer cells. Let's say I'm a pharmaceutical company and I've just developed a new drug. And I think it may be affecting the way that, uh, for example, let's say it, it works on acne. I think it may be affecting the way that cells respond to it. One question I would ask is, well, what's the protein profile? I could take two patients, one whom I give the drug to and another one that I don't, or I could give it to the same one. Here's a portion of my forehead where I use it. Here's a portion of my forehead where I don't and I can compare the, pro the protein profiles of those using 2D gel electrophoresis and quickly get an answer, are there protein changes that are happening in these? In proteomics, the questions that I ask are the only limitation. I can answer tremendous numbers of questions by using this technique. Now, as you look at this and you think about it, one of the first questions that comes to your mind is, well, that's nice, that's a spot, but hey, I mean, it's like saying this spot's different in this one versus that one. How do I know what that is? Okay? And that's not a trivial thing. Understanding what any given spot is is going to take some other work. And that's the second value of this technique. And I'm going to show you that in a, in a little bit more in just a bit. Okay? But suffice it to say that I can identify using some sophisticated techniques every spot on that gel. If I thought I knew, for example, what this particular spot was right here, let's say I thought, oh, that's a DNA polymerase. Okay? If I had some of that DNA polymerase around, I could actually do a 2D gel and see where that DNA polymerase popped up. And I would have some pretty good clues about where I would expect it to pop up based on its PI and its size. I can calculate the PI for my protein fairly readily. And I know the size of my protein fairly readily, so the combination of the two can really lead me very quickly to begin with to answering the question, is this what I think it is? We can answer that question absolutely with some additional techniques I'll be talking about. Okay, questions about this? Yeah? I'm sorry? Yeah, what do you see with smearing? Okay, so... Um, in this case, it looks to me like somebody ran a ladder okay, that didn't run very well. That's one thing. Another thing that happens with smearing is you, realize, you recognize that separating proteins is kind of dynamic. Okay? So we like to think in the very simplest case that, okay, I coat this guy with this SDS, 
and basically that's all that ever happens to it. But in fact, that protein might be a little bit more mobile, and so some of it may not come to as tight of a band as you would expect, and so that's part of the reason for the smearings that you see. Yep. Each, whenever you do a one-dimensional gel, like I described before, where you're separating on the basis of size, you're going to have some smearing there. So if you compound that in two dimensions, okay, each uh, dimension, the cleaner it is, the better the, the, the 2D gel is going to look. But even there, you can see that there's uh, sort of elongated uh, spots that are here, which tell us that our PI is, uh, determination is not as tight as we would like it to be. And that's very common in something like this. Okay, questions? Yeah, back in the back. When you mix the sodium with the sulfate, yep. the But they've already been separate in the basis of PI. But then you're mixing it. Yep. Right. But well, I'm, just, I'm just perfusing it. So it's going in. I'm not mixing them. They're staying. Right, but all it's doing is the SDS is just coming down through it. Okay, so it, that's why I say you perfuse it. You don't actually physically mix it because if you did, you're right, you would lose the relative positions of those. So you want this as gently as possible to come in and start, start mixing with the protein itself without changing its relative position. But, but it's, it's a good point, yeah. I'm sorry? Does I stand for current? Does I stand for current? No, I stands for isoelectric. Okay. Isoelectric. OK. All right, you guys are the quietest class I've ever had. Not complaining, not complaining, but you are. I've never had such a quiet class. Okay, um, let's, um, we've been talking about purification. Let's think about purification. I'm going to come back and tell you in a bit how we determine those spots. Okay, your book isn't real sequ as sequential as I would like, and I'm sort of going in the order of the book here. Let's determine how, let, let's follow how we would measure the purification of a given protein. Well, you've already heard of several techniques that we can use for isolating proteins. You've heard of, uh, uh, we didn't talk about salt fractionation, but basically you can precipitate proteins with salt is what it amounts to. Ion exchange you heard about, gel, uh, gel filtration you heard about, affinity chromatography you, you, you followed. Now, why do we care about this? The reason we care about this is whenever we're trying to purify a protein, basically at each step we have basically two things one that we think doesn't have our protein and one that we think does, right? So we ran an ion exchange column, for example. We said, okay, well, my protein is negatively charged and I put it into an anion, ex uh, an anion exchange column, then it's going to be the last one out, right? So this last one out, okay, this fraction should have my stuff. Well, it means that even though I think that's where it's going to come out, you absolutely have to check it every time. And that's why having that assay to determine what this protein did is useful because you have to be able to tell does this fraction contain my protein? All right? So I have to have some way of measuring if any given fraction contains my protein. Why? Well, if I've got two, one that I think is here and one that I think is here, if I throw the baby out with the bathwater, I just threw away months and months worth of work. So people, when you're working, with, so whenever you're working with proteins, you have to be very careful to make sure you check everything to see where that protein is. Well, no, pro no method is 100% effective. That's what you're going to see from this. So what this is, is, is the plot of is a purification. The very first step was homogenation, meaning we just took the cells and we busted them open. We didn't do anything else. And we took that homogenate and we, first of all, determined the total amount of protein. That included the protein that I wanted and all the other proteins in there. The total amount of protein in that first step I discovered was 15,000 milligrams. Well, I don't care about the total protein. I care about my protein. I want to have some way of measuring my protein. Maybe it's a reaction that it catalyzes. So I measure how many reactions does it catalyze, and I give a unit value to each one of those. We see in this case that the original homogenate that I had had 150,000 units of activity. That was a measure of approximately how much protein I had in there. That was my total units of protein or protein activity to start. So all this in the first line is what I had to start. The specific activity of that mixture was the amount of units of activity that I had divided by the total milligrams of protein. That gave me units per milligram 
a protein. You can see in this case 150,000 divided by 15,000 gives me 10 units per milligram. My yield was 100%. I haven't thrown anything away yet. I haven't done any techniques. I'm just measuring what I'm starting with. So I have 100% to start. And since I haven't purified anything, my purification level is 1, meaning I haven't done anything to it. After the second step, after the second step, okay, um, I discover that I salt fractionate, which gives me uh, some uh, precipitation, and I'm trying to get rid of the things that I don't want. Well, after I do this salt fractionation step, what I discover is I have 4,600 milligrams of protein. I got rid of about two-thirds of the protein. I didn't get rid of two-thirds of the activity. That's good. That means that I had a method that was selectively getting rid of things I didn't want and keeping most of what I did want. In this case, I have 138,000 units of activity. My specific activity went from 10 units per milligram to 30, meaning this divided by 4,600 gives me 30 units per milligram. The yield how much, is, is basically a measure of how much, what percentage of the original material do I still have. 138,000 divided by 150,000 times 100 gives me my yield. In this case, I had a 92% yield. I didn't lose very much in this purification step. That's pretty good. Last, I had a purification level of 3. It was threefold enhanced in activity, meaning that I went from 10 units per milligram to 30. So 30 divided by 10 gave me a purification level of 3. Well, I go through all these other steps and I do the same things, blah, blah, blah. I get down to the bottom and I discovered I've actually done quite a bit of purification. Look that the total protein went from 15,000 milligrams down to a total of 1.75 milligrams by the end. Okay? I lost some activity, and that's going to happen in any, in any process, but I only lost about two-thirds of the activity. I still have two-thirds of the activity. Okay, the next time I hear one go off, you guys are having a pop quiz, and you guys are going to know who you are. Okay? You're going to know who's responsible for it. I don't want to hear the phone again. If you want to get in your bags right now and turn it off, it would be a good time. Everybody get their phone off, because if I hear it again, we're going to have a pop quiz. I've heard two already in this period. Check it now, because your friends are not going to like you if you are the one responsible. <clears throat> Those are very annoying. I have a phone. It has a little vibrate switch. If my phone goes off, you don't hear it. Okay? Yours should be in the same mode or off. <clears throat> Everybody off? Okay. Now, total activity, I lost two-thirds of my activity, but look, I lost 99% of my other protein. I lost a lot more things that I didn't want than I did things that I did want. This guy is very pure. Look at this. The specific activity Units per milligram went from 10 up to 30,000 units per milligram, meaning that most of that milligram that's there is probably the protein that I'm trying to work with. I'm trying to purify. I want to have this protein pure from everything else. Okay? The yield, 35%, okay? which is about what I said before. I lose about two-thirds in this case, but I still have 35% of my total activity. The purification was 3,000-fold. It was 3,000-fold enhanced, and that's uh, what this basically was showing us. Okay, questions about this? Yeah? <laughs> total activity is the activity of the protein that you're interested in. That's correct. Okay, so as I said, we have to have some way of determining do we have our protein in here. So it might be, let's say, an enzymatic reaction that catalyzes a change in a molecule I'm interested in. I could take an aliquot of this and say, how many molecules does it change? This is X number of units, right? So I can determine beforehand how many units for each chain molecule of change. And I did that and came up in this case with 150,000, which was the starting material that I had. Make sense? If I don't have a way of measuring my protein, 
I have no way of knowing how to purify it. I have no way of knowing how to purify it. Because if I, because if I don't know anything about it, then I don't know which, which technique or I don't know which step to keep the one versus the other. So I always have to have a way of measuring the protein that I'm interested in. Okay. Other questions? Yes? Uh, purification level. So purification level is equal to the purification that's here divided by the purification I started with. So I had 30,000 divided by 10. Okay? Yeah? I haven't. Uh, gel filtration does not denature. That's, that's gel electrophoresis. This is gel. Gel filtration is molecular exclusion where it's going through the beads and stuff. It's a good question also, okay? If I had done a gel here, I'd have a hard time uh, doing SDS. I'd have a hard time determining how much protein I've got. But I haven't done that in this particular case, but it's a very good point. So all salt fractionation is is just a technique, okay? It's a technique I haven't talked about, but salt fractionation simply uh, allows you, is a technique whereby you can precipitate proteins selectively by adding certain amounts of salt to them, okay? So I try to pick a concentration of salt that's going to precipitate, say, other proteins, but not my protein. So you want your protein to stay insulated? It can be either way. It doesn't really matter. If you, could, if you can either selectively precipitate it or selectively not precipitate it. It doesn't really matter for our purposes, but a way of getting it away from everything else. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. You have to know something about the protein in order to do it. That's correct. You may not know much about it. You may know it catalyzes this reaction. That's the only thing that you know. But if you know that, you can use this technique to, to, to purify your protein. Okay? But you have to know something that it does. You don't have to know its structure or its size or anything like that. But you do have to know something about what it does in order to, to, to purify it. Okay. Uh, very good. So... Let's turn our attention away from that now. And um, I'll mention S values here because it comes up in your book occasionally. They're not the, the biggest deal in the world. S values are simply ways of measuring a protein. Okay? So you think, well, a protein is measured by size, so size 22,000, et cetera, is it. Well, if you don't know much about your protein and you haven't been able to get it to run properly on a gel, Running it through a centrifugal field tells you the apparent size that it has. So S values are related to the size of a protein. That's all it is. It's a way of measuring size using centrifugal force. Okay? The larger the S value, the larger the size, but there's not a linear relationship. Okay? There's not a linear relationship. Notice that this increases in size by 7.5 times going from here to here. Okay? However, that's way more than seven, this is way more than 7.5 times bigger than that. So S value is simply a way of determining size using a centrifugal field. And we'll hear, you'll hear about S values later in the, in the term. Okay, well, characterizing proteins. So there's several ways that we can do it. I'm going to skip over some of these. And one of the questions I frequently get is, boy, you skip over a lot of things in your lecture. Do we have to know that? Okay. Well, my rule is whatever I say in class has the highest priority. If I don't talk about it in class, I'm not going to hold you responsible for something I don't talk about in class. Okay? So keep that in mind as I go through. And I usually adjust my lectures a little bit depending on how much time I've got. Well, one of the things we could do is an amino acid analysis. Okay? If we have a protein, um, and all we have is a protein, one of the things we could do is we could say, well, what are, what's the composition of amino acids that I have in um, this protein? Not surprisingly, most proteins have all of the amino acids. Okay? But I can get relative amounts. I may have twice as many glycines as I do, alanines as I do in this case, and you can see that when I go to separate them. Okay? So I can get an idea about the composition of amino acids by breaking the protein down into its substituent amino acids and then separating them and quantitating them. Okay? There are a variety of techniques for doing it. Your book talk, it just show, illustrates one here. I think it's easiest to think about with respect to HPLC. We talked about HPLC where we can see these peaks coming out at certain times. It's very easy to line those peaks up with certain molecules that we know about and determine how much of them uh, are present. 
This technique isn't the most important uh, technique for us to be able to uh, purify or characterize things. In order for us to be able to visualize amino acids, most of them don't absorb any light. One of the things that we do, uh, and this is true for proteins, is that we actually attach to them fluorescent dyes. And those fluorescent dyes give, the, give, us, give them color, and as a result of those colors, we can actually see when they're coming off of the detector, for example. So those are useful for us. They also allow us to uh, see uh, the, the protein itself when we're on a uh, gel. So if without, without that, we don't have a very good way of visualizing those proteins that are there. Okay, well, more important in characterizing proteins is the ability to manipulate them. So if I want to manipulate a protein, it turns out that for some of the analyses I'm getting ready to tell you about, these analyses don't allow us to characterize a protein when it's in its full length state. It's much easier for most of the techniques I'm going to describe to you to analyze pieces of the whole. Okay? Well, how do I get pieces of a protein? If I break up a protein, I don't want just random breaking because that's not going to help me much. I want to have some defined pieces. Here's the, here's the, the uh, amino end. Here's the middle. Here's the carboxyl end, something like that. Okay? Well, to do that, I have to have reagents that break the protein at specific places in the polypeptide chain. One of these is a chemical called cyanogen bromide. You see it depicted on the screen. Here is a polypeptide, and here is a methionine inside of that polypeptide. The methionine is bound to another amino acid. Treatment of this protein with chemical cyanogen bromide will cause a break to occur at the place where methionine was. See the break? Okay. So we've broken this guy here into two pieces, this one on the left and this one down here. So wherever there's a break, I mean, sorry, wherever there's a, a methionine in a polypeptide chain, cyanogen bromide will break it. Okay? That's uh, an important consideration. And you'll notice that it breaks it on the carboxyl side of this um, uh, methionine. Here's the amino end. Here's the carboxyl end. The break occurs right here across that black bond. So instead of breaking on the amino side, if it broke it over here, it's breaking on the carboxyl side, which is over here. Okay? So cyanogen bromide allows me to break this guy into two pieces, specifically at methionine residues. Well, it turns out there's also, there are also enzymes that will do the same thing. Enzymes have specificities for breaking proteins at specific places. So I need to give you an, a, a term here you need to know, a protease. A protease is an enzyme that breaks peptide bonds. It catalyzes the breakage of peptide bonds. We'll talk about many proteases this term. The specific one I'm going to talk about here is called trypsin. Trypsin is a very important protease in your body. Your body uses proteases for a variety of things. One of them, of course, digestion. Other things that, are, that proteases are involved in are activating enzymes, activating other proteins. We'll see how that works later. But suffice it to say that your body needs proteases to do some of the things that it does. Well, trypsin is a protease that cleaves on the carboxyl side of lysine or arginine. Meaning, just like where I have methionine before, if I have a protein that has a lysine or arginine on the carboxyl side of it, trypsin is going to cleave that peptide bond. You can see it being broken right there. And we get two pieces again. So now we're starting to see various reagents, some chemical, some enzymatic, that we can use to break polypeptide chains down into smaller pieces. Okay. Here is a table of a bunch of them. Okay. Now, here's the deal. Okay. If the cell phones go off one more time during before the next exam, you're responsible for the whole table. Okay? 
That means every class period you come in, and as long as I don't hear it, you're not going to have to memorize the table. Pretty good deal. If I hear one, then you're going to have to memorize it, and everybody's going to know who's responsible. OK? Good incentive? Now, there are, at a minimum, three things you're going to need to know out here. Sandage and bromide. Irrespective of the cell phone, you have to know cyanogen and bromide. OK? Trypsin. Irrespective of the cell phone, you need to know where it cleaves. Same thing with cyanogen bromide. Where does it cleave? And the third one turns out to be very easy. It's carboxypeptidase A. And I'm going to make it really simple for you. OK? The really simple thing is this. We're going to ignore the not arginine, lysine, or proline. In other words, it cleaves starting with the carboxyl amino acid and chews inwards sequentially, one at a time. And if we leave off arginine, lysine, or proline, then you just learned that one already very easily. Carboxypeptidase A starts at the carboxyl terminus and just starts chewing sequentially in, one at a time. Eventually, Carboxypeptidase A will, in fact, take a polypeptide and leave you with only amino acids. You can see why something like that would be very useful for you in terms of um, digestion. Because in digestion, you're taking proteins from another organism. You're breaking down the amino acids that are there so that you can use them to make proteins of your own. OK, questions about that? We clear on the cell phones? OK, good. Yeah? Uh huh? So in carboxypeptidase A, how do you get it to stop? The answer is you don't. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to work with. You can imagine once this thing gets going, it's just going to start chewing up. And the other question that frequently comes up is, will the proteases work on themselves? Yes. That's one of the ways it stops. It's going to chew some of itself up as well. Is that your question? It cleaves on the amino side. That's correct, yeah. It has to because on the carboxyl side, there isn't, it's not attached to anything with the carboxyl terminus. That's the only one that cleaves on the amino side. OK. Yeah. So his question is, how do you stop this? That's kind of what she asked over here. You don't stop it. So you can't. You, you, an enzymatic reaction like that is very difficult to control, and you don't. So it's, it's useful in terms of breaking a polypeptide down into, you know, into basically amino acids. But it's not real useful as a laboratory tool unless you have sophisticated ways of isolating things as they come off. So it's, it's not a, a real useful tool that way. OK? Yeah? I know we don't have no RDLIs in the program. What happens when it stops? It stops. Yeah. Well, you don't stop it. I mean, it stops. So again, we're talking about this as if you're controlling it. You're not. It's actually the physical limitation of those things that are there. But you're right. That's, that's the place where it would stop. What's that? We're ignoring <laughs> As long as the cell phone stays off, we're all happy, right? OK, that gives you guys some incentive to remember that, OK? OK, I think that's enough for today. What do you guys think? How you doing? Hi, good. How are you? Fine. Good. So um, I came in a couple Fridays ago, remember, about asking some questions on the, home, the, the practice problems. I don't, but, uh, but, okay. uh, but I'll take your word for it. OK. And um, you asked me to come in last week, but I was so busy last okay. week that I wasn't able to. I was wondering sure. what time you're busy today or? Uh, today I'm not real busy. I've got somebody, I'm meeting with somebody back after class at 1, and I've got another meeting at 2, and I've got to be home to check about somebody spending installation in my house at 3. So if you want to come in, say, by, I'll probably leave about 2.30 to walk back to my house. But if you come in before 2.30, that'd be fine. OK. Um, what time will your meeting be done at 1? 
Um, this is I have class at two and then at four. So we're well, if you want, you, you can follow me back and I can see with her when when we're done. How about okay. that? Okay. okay. Sure. Sounds hi. Um, hi. I emailed you about this, but uh, it was over the weekend, so uh -huh. I don't know if you got it. And it was just I finally got a chance to watch the lecture that I missed. Okay. Oh, um, and this confused me because earlier in the lecture you said that when it was off, it had a charge of negative one, and when it was on, it had a charge of plus one, and then later someone asked and you said off, negative one, on, zero. For a carboxyl, that's correct. Okay. Off is always negative one, and on is always zero. Okay, because okay. you said two different things. I wanted oh, to clarify yeah. which one it actually was. If I did, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I collected I about 10 pounds of chanterelles, and I was wondering if you like chanterelles, and you want some. Oh, wow. <laughs> so. uh, uh, twist my arm. I, I can't take them right now, uh, unfortunately. Um, um, I'll, I could drop them by your office later. Drop them by my office. Yeah, they're great. Thank you. That's just kind of Yeah. Hi. Um, do the OHs in the different amino acids ionize? The OHs in the different amino acids. It turns out that the um, tyrosine ionizes to a slight extent, which is why you see the uh, fact that it has a PKA, but I said you weren't responsible for knowing it. Okay. So the only things that we need to know that are ionizable are the amino acid. Amino, Wait. carboxyl, and the sulfhydryl of, of uh, cysteine. Sulfhydryl. And carboxyl, the carboxyl, oh, wait, there's two carboxyl ones, like arginine, arginine and arginine, or arginate. So arginine has an amino R group. And then once it's car or once it's in the carboxyl form, it doesn't, it doesn't oxidize. No, 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 it, it always has a carboxyl. So uh, every, every group that can ionize has a PKA. Yeah. So an R, uh, a carboxyl... Uh, on arginine will ionize just like a carboxyl on anything else will ionize. There's not, a, so it all depends on the pH so, at which so it's at. So both the like, because there's the two groups with like, there's the carboxyl.